Josh Kaufman, welcome to the show. Chris, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. I thought we'd give some context to the listeners who tune into our, the channel Making a Club Champion, give you some sort of context of the work you do. Say you're in a swanky New York rooftop bar and someone comes up to you and asks you, uh, what do you do for a living? How do you define that? Because I know you do so much. Sure. So uh, probably the best way to describe it is I'm a full-time researcher and author. And I specialize in taking universal complex areas of life, uh, for example, business and learning new skills and uh, pursuing big creative projects, uh, things that, that we all uh, interact with or, or have to deal with in, in some way, shape or form. And I try to figure out the most important bits of that. And so my writing really focuses on straightforward, practical wisdom. How do you decide what you want to do? go about getting that thing that you want and then make decisions and trade-offs in a smart and sensible way. And so it's really just getting better results in whatever it is that you've decided is important to you. How did this come to be? Just a facet of your life which you wanted to improve or was it just uh, to help yeah. others? A bit of both. So uh, my brain just naturally tries to figure out the most important bits of whatever it is that I'm I'm reading about or learning or experimenting with. Um, so that's the part of the work that, that I would do if it were not my job. The real purpose in writing specifically is, is I found that the highest um, and best investments that I've come across in my life have almost always been books. And so I've taken so much away from the the research and the experimentation and the writing that other people have done that I really want to create things that do the same thing for other people. And so no matter the book, the the goal is to help the the widest variety and and most people that I can. I know you you've been author of I think is it three books now? Yeah, three books. How do you go about picking which books interest you initially or a given topic to for you to sort of dive in? Uh, so the book usually comes about as a result of a personal project or a personal project or something that I've been thinking about for a very long time. So my first book, The Personal MBA, came about as a result of actually my first uh, job out of college. Long story short, I was going to be working with a bunch of people who had just graduated from top 15 MBA programs. And I wanted to make sure that that I knew all of the things that I needed to know in order to do well in this this job that I was starting. And so the personal MBA is essentially uh, a synthesis of years worth of, of reading and research on how to understand what businesses are, what they do, and then how to make good decisions in a business context. So very personal project turned, hey, this may be useful to a lot of people, so let's put it in a form that other people can benefit from. The second book, the personal or the first twenty hours, uh, actually came out of a lot of uh, research that I was doing about learning specifically, and and the impetus for that was uh, my wife and I welcomed our uh, first child into the world, uh, my daughter Leela, and all of a sudden I didn't have a whole lot of free time in order to learn and do the things that I, I wanted to learn. I, I was forced to become much more efficient in how I spend my time. And I wanted that time to be as effective as it could possibly be. So the first 20 hours came out of the research on if you only have a certain amount of time to do the things you want to do, how can you invest that time in the most um, effective, profitable way that you, you possibly can? The, my latest book, uh, How to Fight a Hydra, which just came out uh, as we're recording this uh, a few weeks ago, is about uncertainty, risk, and fear of the unknown. And so a big thing that I was hearing from people after reading uh, Personal MBA and after reading First 20 Hours is, well, what if I'm not sure if this is right for me? Or, or what if I don't know if I'm going to be capable of doing this thing I want to do? There was this undercurrent of fear uh, of not being able to do the things that you want to do or being concerned that it's not going to, to turn out the way that you want it to turn out. And so How to Fight a Hydra um, is a way of examining what it means to do something that is beyond your current capabilities. How do you decide to do something that you know is going to be difficult from the beginning and decide to move forward and invest knowing or without knowing what the results of that are, are going to be in advance? 
Uh, so, so very much treating new projects, new desires, big goals as more of an adventure and less of a, a project or something to become very concerned about. Fantastic. I'm sure we'll, we'll dive in on all, all three of those at some point. I just want to, I think I first came across your work was, was the talk, the, um, the first 20 hours and how to learn anything. And mm-hmm. as, especially as a golfer with so many sort of assets to the game and, and so many sort of subcategories and elements of the game to work on. I was wondering, you seem very good at sort of deconstructing uh, projects and, and new ventures. I was wondering if we could perhaps touch on sort of the five steps of deconstructing any new skill and the best way of implementing something which you really want to learn or pick up. Absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, I think I mentioned golf a few times in, in the first 20 hours. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Most, mostly because it's it's a very easy way to visualize uh, all of, of the things that go into it. So um, I am not a golfer, but it's it's a really great way of, of illustrating how this this thing works. So um, I'll, I'll go through the steps uh, quickly and then we can we can apply that specifically to golf or you know more broadly uh, physical motor skills. So something that you would want to be able to do in in uh, a body movement kind of context. Great. So the the general method behind the first twenty hours, um, five basic steps, and, and the first is decide what you want to be able to do, which a lot of people have problem with this one. Um, so in, in a golfing context, this would be like, I want to become really good at golf. Well, that doesn't really help you. It's, it's not specific enough. It doesn't give you any direction on what parts of golf do you want to improve? What do you want to get out of it? Um, what is the reward for all of this, um, this time and effort that you're looking at investing in this particular skill? So being very specific and concrete about what it is you want to be able to do uh, gives you a lot more information on how to go about practicing in a way that's actually going to to produce those results that you want. So the second part is deconstruct the skill into smaller subskills. And golf is a great illustration of this because you know playing golf is not a single activity. You're doing lots of different things in the course of a single game. You know whether whether that is um, driving off the tee or or uh, putting into uh, the hole at, at the end. The, the discrete physical activities that you are doing at every stage of the game are completely different and may require different skills and different methods of practice in order to get good at each of them. And so the more you're able to take this broad thing that you want to do and then break it down into the smallest discrete subskills that you can recognize – uh, the more that you're going to be able to figure out which of those subskills are going to give you most of the results, and those are the ones that you should focus on on uh, practicing first. The third is to learn enough about each subskill to self-correct during practice. So uh, this this has two purposes. Uh, so the first purpose is when people uh, decide to learn something new. There is very often a impulse to go uh, read and research and and learn a lot about the thing that you're trying to do, but learning is not practice. Um, it is in your best interest to spend yes a little bit of time uh, researching upfront, and that is you know you can do that through books or courses or DVDs or working with an instructor to help you figure out what the most important things are first. Uh, But in the same vein, you don't want to spend too much time in uh, research mode because that becomes a very effective form of procrastination. And so the the ideal is you're learning enough about each subskill so you're able to self-correct during practice to to actually go out, do the thing you're trying to do, and recognize when when you're making a mistake or you're not doing it the way that you want to do. And... Uh, be able to adjust on the fly because it's that feedback loop of trying something, seeing how it works, and then adjusting as you go. That's where a lot of the actual skill acquisition takes place. The uh, The fourth step is uh, removing barriers to practice. And those barriers can be physical, mental, or emotional. So uh, this might be figuring out in a golf context, when are you going to go play? 
Uh, do you have all of your equipment ready? Where is it stored? How is it maintained? Anything that you can do to make it easier for you to get to the course and practice in the way that you have decided is best for you, all of those things are going to help you improve uh, far more quickly than uh, leaving it to chance and happenstance whenever you can get out uh, out to the course, uh, things like that. And then the fifth and, and arguably the most important, uh, there's a reason that the book is called The First 20 Hours. Uh, the fifth step is pre-committing to practicing the most important subskills for at least 20 hours. And the the 20 hour range was chosen deliberately. So um, just in, in terms of being able to visualize what that looks like, it's about 40 minutes a day for about a month. And so uh, there are lots of different ways you can you can split up that time, but the pre-commitment is the part that has the most juice. And the pre-commitment is designed to help you get through those early stages of practice when you know full well you're not performing in the way that you want to be able to perform. And those early hours, if you're not prepared for them, can be extremely frustrating. So one of the biggest barriers to people uh, learning and practicing new skills is that is those early hours are just torture. You know you're bad. You don't want to be bad. You're trying to do things differently, but it's not working. Uh, most people quit after a few hours of of experiencing that I'm really terrible and I'm afraid this is going to continue forever. And so the pre-commitment to a certain period of time is the best thing that you can do to ensure that you practice enough so your brain can do the necessary rewiring and your body can can learn the necessary movements to actually start improving in that area. So the pre-commitment, 20 hours is enough to go from knowing absolutely nothing about what you're trying to do to performing reasonably well, reasonably consistently. Um, it's, it's a nice general purpose mark. And so if you're willing to pre-commit to at least 20 hours of, of focused practice on this particular thing you want to learn how to do, that's a really good indication that there's enough of a reward there for you that you're going to find that practice fruitful. Amazing. Um, uh, and I know I, I, can, I can safely back you up on this, that you're a man of your word, because um, for the listeners, they can they can YouTube your name and watch the TEDx talk of you playing the, uh, is it Waikulele or Ukulele? Uh, ukulele, <laughs> ukulele or ukulele, ukulele, depending on what part of the States you're from. <laughs> and um, <laughs> you're doing some sort of a, a rap of many different songs, learning this the new skill and there's some sort of structure which you just laid out. I was wondering since that talk, because it's it's got something like 12 million views, but that was in 2013, what other skills you have learned along the way in the same sort of steps that you've applied yeah. to other areas of your life? So uh, when I was writing about the first 20 hours, uh, a big goal for me was not to have this be completely research synthesis. Uh, it wasn't just going into a library and and figuring out, okay, this is how you're supposed to go about doing it. I wanted to field test this with a lot of different things. Um, so playing ukulele was was one of them. Um, I learned how to type on a different keyboard layout, which was mind bending and weird. And I, I'm actually uh, I have continued using that layout to this day for for all of my work. Uh, it's it's called Colmac, uh, C O L E M A K. If anybody wants to look it up, yeah, I'll um, put it in way the more efficient. Notes. Yeah. Oh, it's it's great. Is that the curved keyboard? It's all. Uh, no, so it, it actually rearranges, if I'm remembering correctly, 13 of the keys on the standard QWERTY keyboard. And it has two goals. One is to make your typing a lot more efficient. So it will put the most commonly used letters on the home row uh, instead of having them spread out across the, the keyboard. And the other thing that it does is as it's making those shifts, it tends to preserve the uh, – the key combinations, so if you use shortcuts to save documents and open and close things, those uh, those keys have not been rearranged, so you don't have quite the frustration of having to to remap all of, of your uh, keyboard muscle memory. Okay. Uh, so the best way I can describe it is um, if you're typing on a standard uh, English QWERTY layout, uh, it kind of feels like your hands are flying all over the keyboard. And uh, with Colmac, it feels like you're twiddling your fingers and words are appearing on the screen. It's, okay. it's pretty cool. Right. So uh, I learned that. 
I learned uh, windsurfing, which was great fun. Um, I learned yoga and computer programming. And I'm forgetting one right now. Uh, Go, the game of Go. You know, the the, uh, strategy game with black and white stones? Never heard of it. Uh, so it is a, uh, one of the most popular games in the world, um, <laughs> okay. ex- extremely popular in, uh, in China and Japan and Korea. Um, so think of it as a, the best analogy I can use is if you imagine a chessboard. Oh, it's like and, drafts. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually not familiar with that. What is that? Drafts, you have black and white and then it's the same as chess, but you just can go one direction and you hop in diagonals. Uh, okay, so we've. I think um, in America that's called checkers. Okay. Uh, so a little bit more like if chess is a battle, um, Go is one level of abstraction higher, and it's a war. So you're you're trying to surround your opponent and uh, uh, limit their movement in some important ways. So fascinating game. Um, actually, probably most um, pop culture wise if if you've ever watched the the movie a beautiful mind that came out yes. what years and years and years ago uh crazy awesome mathematician um there's this game with russell black Crow. and white stones that that he yeah exactly russell crow uh that he plays with a colleague uh, out in a courtyard and that game is go okay got it crazy complicated game uh so it was a really good uh, good example of an intense cognitive skill that you would decide to pick up just for fun, um, out of personal interest, things like that. So yeah, in, in, in the first 20 hours, I tried to have a mix of both physical skills, motor skills and cognitive skills. So things that you just learn. And then I wanted to have examples of doing it in both a professional context. So things that you would do for work. And then also in a personal context, things that you would pick up as a hobby or just out of personal interest. So uh, it it sounds like you you are able to sort of define uh, what you want almost quite easily, which is is almost the hardest point which um, you referred to. And I think many people sort of struggle for is actually defining what they actually want to do and and spend a lot of time in the first place. Mm-hmm. So how how do you go about sort of defining how you're going to spend your energy and time? So there are a couple of different ways to do it, and the the best first advice that I can give is. Um, just take a notebook or a sheet of paper and start writing down what you want. Like a lot of times we tend to keep these sorts of desires up in our head where, where they just kind of bounce around. We remember them every once in a while, but they're very hard to examine. And the best thing that you can do is as you're writing these down, um, there's, there's a, a great acronym, uh, PICS, P-I-C-S, uh, that, that helps make these more useful to you. So write it in positive, immediate, concrete, and specific terms. So instead of a broad, you know, uh, let's let's go to something like language. Uh, instead of saying something like "I want to learn learn Italian," it might be, "I want to go on a holiday to Italy and order all of my meals uh, and interact with uh, with the wait staff in Italian." That's a, a far more concrete and specific way of describing what it is that you want to be able to do. Uh, Whereas, you know, something general like learn Italian could be, uh, could be anything. Uh, It could be passing a a certain uh, language fluency tests of which there are many. Um, It might be able to, you know, read a book in uh, this, read this specific book in this language. Um, there are lots of different ways that it could look. So the the more that you are able to describe in detail what you want to be able to do, the easier it is to imagine yourself doing that, which is useful uh, in all sorts of ways. But it also gives you a really good indication of how close you are to that thing. So as you're improving, you're able to see yourself getting closer and closer and closer and closer to this specific thing that you have decided you wanted to be able to do. So it's easier to gauge your progress. Um, After you've written down a bunch of options, um, one very common challenge is that uh, the human mind really hates making trade-offs. So we we hate uh, deciding to not do certain things. And so um, 
the the classic uh, priority setting methods are are very challenging because it kind of of um, gets you into a situation where if you're trying to answer for yourself what is most important, let me rank these. Uh, very often, the challenge that most people face is, well, I want all of these things. That's why I wrote them down in the first place. Um, it's really difficult to get ourselves to the point of of looking at all the things that we might want and saying, this is important, this is important, and everything else can wait for now. And so a really great way of doing that that I've, I've found very handy over the years is write down all of the things that you want and then – Take a moment and then cut the list in half. So half of them stay, half of them go on a separate list saying, yeah, maybe I'll do that some at some point in the future, but it's not important enough for me to do right now. And then keep cutting that list in half again and again until you're down to two or three things, two or three things. And those things, the last couple cuts are are brutal. Uh, it is it is sometimes an emotional process of deciding to let go of certain things for now. Um, but those last couple cups are also the most valuable. It's where you learn the most about what's really going to give you what you want. And uh, the things that, you know, yeah, sound good to you uh, might be worth doing in, in the future, but are are worthy of being deferred. I, I think you will touch on on your new book uh, in a bit, how, how to Fight a Hydra. But I think you, you said something in that book where it, it sort of struck a chord with me anyway but it says the only thing worse than fighting a hydra is fighting more than one hydra at the same time uh, do you strongly believe that it's it's very important just to focus on one thing at a time and, and pursuing that until you've reached where you're trying to go before moving on to something else or can yeah. can you juggle more than one thing at a time it really depends on on the scope of everything that's going on in your life and so one of the very common questions about skill acquisition in, in general is like, do I have to choose just one thing? Mm. Um, and and it, that really depends on how much uh, discretionary time and energy do you have during the day? Um, I certainly wouldn't recommend more than two or three, depending on what your schedule looks like. And so, you know, for example, if, if you are a, uh, a college student and you – are, you are not in a long-term relationship and you don't have kids, you're going to have an, a, a much broader scope of discretionary time than somebody uh, for whom the, all those things might be true. And so it's really important to figure out, okay, is this can I commit to more than one 40 minutes a day for a month sort of commitment? If so, then then yeah, give it a shot, see how it goes. Uh, but it, it really comes down to how much time and energy do you have to invest in this particular way? And if you have that time and energy to invest, then then absolutely that's an option for you. I, I think with uh, one thing about golf is that it, it's so time consuming and yeah. especially if someone's invest, invested, I don't know, say they were sort of pushed hard when they're sort of in their early teens, they've done, they've, they've probably in their like early twenties or late twenties, maybe in their thirties, they've, they've probably passed the 10,000 hour rule. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're, they're at this sort of top 1% of the, maybe their country, or they, you know, they play county or they may have played for their country and, and things haven't paid off. How, how does someone know that, that, that they should keep pursuing uh, that path or, or should they change over to to another direction in their life? And sort of second part of that question is, is that once I think someone has gone through that journey themselves, they realize how much energy it takes to get to that mm -hmm. sort of level, that they could also transfer that into another area of their life that they may not want to pursue another direction because they also know how much pain and energy it does take to commit like that. And if it doesn't pay off that they might sort of have that sort of sense of overwhelm or anxiety, you know, is this the right path? I was wondering if we, we could sort of touch on that with sort of like a golfing sort of background or mindset. It could be, and it could be like tennis as well. Yeah. 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 It's, it's an excellent question. And, and it goes to one of the, the major themes uh, in how to fight a Hydra actually, um, which is, 
life would be a lot easier in in many circumstances if we could see the future. And so, you know, if if it, if it was a guarantee that if we just, you know, buckle down and focused for the next two or three years, we would get the results we wanted, whether that was playing professionally or representing your country or or um, whatever imagined reward uh, sounds and feels really good to you and that you may have been pursuing for a long time. I mean, this this is far beyond golf, far beyond tennis. This is one of the fundamental struggles that people have in life, uh, both in deciding to invest in the first place and in deciding that you have invested enough and it's time for something different. And so, you know, the the first basic step is to figure out really like what what do you want? What is the reward that you are getting out of this activity right now? If you imagine that this is the level of reward that you are going to have, is this enough? Are you skilled enough to get what you want? So for example, you know, if, if you've had the goal of playing professionally for a very long time and it looks like that is unlikely to happen, are there good reasons for you to continue to play, to continue to practice? Is there something fundamental in the process that is rewarding to you? Hmm. If there is, you should absolutely keep doing it and you should keep doing it for the reward that you are getting from the, the continued effort and investment itself. So if greater things happen be, uh, as a result of that, then wonderful. That's a bonus. But you should be getting a uh, reward from the investment that you're making on a much shorter time scale than, you know, maybe in two or three years, I'll get to this next plateau. And, and a lot of that, um, I've seen a lot of people through my work, uh, in personal MBA, uh, and this is very common in the business world is, uh, thinking along the lines of, I will be happy with my career when X is true. And, and maybe that's when I get a promotion, um, when I start a business, when I make my first million dollars, uh, when I am acclaimed in my industry or, or achieve some significant level of recognition. And what, what very often uh, is the case with folks who have those, those contingent plans, like I'm going to be happy when something that I do not control is not true, they tend to not only be dissatisfied with the process of getting there, they also tend to find when they have achieved that result, it's not as rewarding as they hoped it would be. Hmm. Uh, the same problems keep coming up. And so what I always advocate is figuring out what is the what is the benefit, what is the draw, what is the reward of the process that you are undertaking right now? Like where where's the the um, awesomeness in that for you now? And is that continued investment of time worth it in and of itself for its own sake or because of the things that it um, it gives you right now? Um, so a, a good example, in motor skill territory for me is, um, I have always wanted to learn a martial art and I didn't know which one. And I lived in a small town in Northern Ohio, so I didn't really have any, uh, options uh, to speak of. It was just something that I always wanted to do. Uh, so a couple of years, about two years ago now, I, uh, started studying Aikido and the best way to describe Aikido is think, uh, judo. So you're, you're throwing, tripping, um, subduing an opponent um, it's purely defensive, but it, it tends to happen a little bit further away. So think a couple of steps away from a person who is attacking you versus, you know, up close and personal right away. Um, so the classic uh, external reward in martial arts is uh, uh, getting your black belt, right? When are, how, how long does it take to make black belt? And I'm going to be so happy when I'm a black belt. Well, in Aikido, it's, it's a very technical art. And it tends to take a long time. So eight to 10 years uh, is, is likely for me. And I'm about two years into the process. And, and so if, if the black belt was the goal and I'm not going to be happy or satisfied with the practice until I get there, that's a really psychologically difficult position to be in. Uh, but if I focus on what am I getting out of the practice right now? Why am I studying this in the first place? Why is this a good use of time and energy? 
what am I getting better at in a way that's rewarding as I am practicing in the moment? Um, it almost doesn't matter how long it takes uh, to get there if I ever get there at all because I'm reaping rewards every step of the way. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, a really great answer. And I think it was something that I, the reason why I brought it up was, is I think it was, I don't think I've ever shared this with anyone apart from sort of my close friends. And it was a sort of a personal experience I went through of dedicating so much time and lots of sacrifices when I was growing up to something which I love, which was golf. And I, I, you know, wanted to do it professionally and I would probably say it, you know, it, it didn't, it didn't work out. I took it to sort of college level in America, but I, I never was able to get that step further to, to becoming a professional and sort of living life on tour. And it, it was, it was that sort of, you know, once I've decided to do something, I'm very strong willed and, you know, I stick my foot in, uh, you're not moving me from this until I achieve it sort of attitude and then that transfers over to er other areas of my life, such as doing something like an Ironman or doing um, triathlons or, or, or marathons and, and things like that. I was wondering how people can keep balance in their life while pursuing something that matters most to them. Yeah, that's a really good question, too. I, I, I think the biggest thing uh, balance wise, and, and this kind of goes to skill acquisition in, in the broader sense, Um when people tend to focus on one skill to the exclusion of, of others in a very intense way over a very long period of time, um, there can very often be some uh, mental, emotional happiness and, and wellness impact from that. Um, so human beings are social creatures. We need to be around other people. Uh, we need to have uh, variety and novelty in the things that we do. Um, and so I think a really good way of thinking about if, if the goal of all of, of the things that we pursue is living a better, more fulfilling life, whatever better and more fulfilling, uh, looks like for you, there needs to be a mix of pursuits. So, you know, in the same way that, um, for example, uh, doing something very cognitively demanding, which which a lot of work now is is turning less from uh, from physical exertion to uh, mental and emotional exertion. Um, if you are are straining your mind to the utmost extent all day every day, and you don't have something uh, to counterbalance that, so a physical skill, something that gets you moving uh, away from the computer, away from uh, your desk, it, you're going to have a really rough go of it. Um, and, and in the same way, if, if everything is about the, the pursuit of one particular goal and, and you limit your relationships and your, um, uh, your social contact, you're going to have a rough go of that too. And so I think it's, it's really important to make sure that you have pursuits and meaningful things that you are trying to improve in many different areas of your life, physical, mental, um, social and, and, uh, skill improvement or acquisition based. How, how, how about you, is that mumbling my words, but how would one go about doing that and juggling so many sort of different types of elements in their life rather than just pursuing one thing and going after that? Is it not to reach the top at a given field? You have to dedicate your time to one thing uh, and truly become the, the, the master of your craft? Or can you spread yourself thinly like that and have other outside interests? Because I think I, I, when it comes to like golf or uh, like tennis or a anyone who's sort of mastered their craft, we look at them and just probably feel like that's all they have going in their life. And that's that's the the one thing that consumes their mind all day and every day. Yeah, I, I think there are part, there are elements of truth to that, and there are elements where it is easy to to over assume what somebody's life looks like on a day to day basis. So there's actually quite a bit of research here. Um, so part of uh, the the genesis of 
what's now known as the the 10,000 hour rule came from the uh, the work of um, a gentleman named K. Anders Ericsson, uh, who did a lot of this this early research. And and his his focus was on expertise and what does it take to develop world class expertise, um, typically in in um, high performing um, ultra competitive fields. And, and sport is a, a really great example of that. And so uh, if you've heard the term deliberate practice, that was uh, Dr. Erickson's research. But one of the things that he found that that is kind of glossed over or doesn't have enough attention paid to it is that even the the most elite ultra high performing uh, folks in in any given field were only able to sustain productively about four hours of deliberate practice a day. Some people would put in more hours, but those hours were uh, less effective and of lower quality than other other people who, yeah, put in the time and and made the uh, that particular skill and the development of it the primary focus in their life. And yet your brain and body can only keep it up for so long before it needs a break. And so I think if there is something that you are, are pursuing as a primary pursuit, something that you have decided is the most important thing for you right now, then that's awesome. And you should absolutely continue doing that. And I think that you can focus on improving that to the extent of your capability and still have enough time to do other important things um, that that feed you and keep you healthy and well-maintained for the long term. Um, there doesn't need to be a trade-off there. So, and, and a lot of times it looks like choosing how you do those other things in an efficient way. So, for example, um, I, I read a lot, I write a lot, um, I have a lot of hours in front of a computer. And so I need physical activity, but I also don't have all day for it. And so choosing efficient means of physical activity, um, the, the two ones or the two things that I'm doing right now that work really well for me are uh, kettlebells for strength training and uh, jump rope for cardio. And so I can take a break from my work. I can do something that is is good for my body and that helps my mind recharge a little bit. And it, it only has to take half an hour and I get some really great benefits of it in a very time efficient way. Um, so I can pursue that and also pursue it with the understanding that I am never going to be the world kettlebell champion ever. Right, okay. <laughs> I'm a long, a long <laughs> way away from that. But I can I, I figured out how to learn how to do it well and do it safely and do it consistently. And I can reap the benefits of doing it without worrying about comparing myself to how other people are doing it or, or what I can swing in comparison to anybody else. That's not the goal. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. So your, your one focus would be say writing uh, the new book and then you'd have the outside interests, which just complement the, maybe your one objective for that six month period or given year. Exactly. And then you can figure out if any of those outside interests are actively interfering. Um, so, uh, for example, um, I'm doing the martial arts, I'm doing the weightlifting, but if I overdo the weightlifting, the martial arts gets impacted because I'm too sore. Um, so you can figure out, you know, we, we live in a world of trade-offs and so you can figure out how to, to strike the balance of getting what you want out of all the things that you're doing. And then not necessarily forcing something to give you benefits that it's not well equipped to give you. Yeah, no, I, I, I think we we can agree that's that's probably a good way of, of planning out how how to focus your time. Um, I was wondering with 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 that is, I think I feel like focus is almost probably one of the biggest strengths these days with so many different mediums trying to steal your attention your phone, laptop, all of the social networks. What, what are some of the ways people can be more productive with the, the time they do have planned for a given day or week with, with, a, with the specific uh, mindset in mind of, of, of that one thing they are looking to achieve in the, in the six months to a year? 
I think the best way to think about that is look at all of the ways that you are currently spending your time and then go through and try to find the lower value uh, things that, that are consuming your focus and attention and replace those with things that have a higher payout or a payoff or benefit to you. Um, so a really great low hanging fruit for, for most people is uh, time spent in front of the television. Um, it, you can almost always find something that is going to be either in the long term healthier or more rewarding for you. Um, not to say you have to get rid of it entirely, but I think because we only have a limited amount of, of time and energy and attention in any given day. If you're going to do more of one thing, then as a natural consequence, you're going to have to choose to do less of something else that you're currently doing. Mm -hmm. And so the 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 less engaged ways that we typically spend time, um, a lot of times that's television, a lot of times that is uh, internet browsing, or you know the 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 ways that that you kind of put your your brain and your body into screensaver mode, for lack of a better word those are going to be the most fruitful finding time to do these new things that, that you wanted to do. Um, so for example, um, when I was learning to, to play the ukulele, uh, the, the thing that worked the best for me was replacing, I had just a little bit of time. It was about half an hour every night before I, I went to bed. And so, uh, my wife and daughter would, would go to bed a little bit earlier than me. And I would choose to, instead of, you know, doing random reading or watching TV or watching movies or, or internet surfing or whatever, that was just my time to sit down and, and figure out how to play this, this instrument. And so I think if you, if you understand that you're always going to have to make trade-offs in deciding to spend more time in one area and, and less time in another, just focus on improving the quality of the trade-offs you're making. And, and that's a really great way to not just figure out how to free up some time for, for these things that you've decided are important to you, but also how you can continually you make better use of your available time and energy, um, uh, next month and next year and 10 years from now, it's always the same challenge. You, you seem to be a, a very good communicator and, and the, the use of your, your words and language. Is this, is this something you've worked on uh, yourself uh, as, as one of these sort of set tasks? Uh, I think one of the things that I've tried very deliberately to do over the past 10 years that I've been doing this is as much as I can think very clearly about what's important and how things work and, you know, a, a little bit of skill acquisition in, in terms of, um, you know, I, I have taken public speaking courses and, uh, have tried to improve this as a skill over, over the years. But I really, in, in any book or, uh, course or, or thing that I create, I really want to try to understand what I'm talking about as, as clearly as I possibly can. And, and I think the, the, if, if I am able to succeed in that, it just makes communicating about it much easier. Mm. But, uh, I don't know if there's a secret, uh, aside from thinking about this a lot and then really, really polishing it in, into something that makes sense to, to people's, uh, who, to people who are not me. <laughs> No, absolutely. I mean, it, it seems like you're you, you you're able to think very clearly, and there's no waffle in your words, and you're you're very precise with what you're trying to communicate. So, and thanks, I appreciate that. Yeah, I I, I think that's a good transition as well to to your new book, um, which is called How to Fight a Hydra, and that that sort of simplicity approach and that clear way of thinking is is definitely demonstrated in in your new book because I think. The one thing I really loved uh, about it when when it, when it arrived to me was a how short it was and it um, but how precise it was as well and it was something that well I read over a cup of coffee and it was just a great little novel uh, an analogy of attacking your fears and I was just wondering if you could perhaps touch on how this new book came to be and give us a brief breakdown about how to fight a hydra. 
Sure. So I told the early part of the story of hearing from readers of of both Personal MBA and First 20 Hours about the the doubts and the fears and the hesitations they had about pursuing something new. And uh, I, I, I tell the story uh, towards the end of the book, but I, I also had uh, this experience of, of working on an, another book. And it was, it was a book essentially about time management and productivity techniques, how to get more done during a day. And I was working on it and, and, and just uh, the thinking that I was doing wasn't coming across in a clear way. It, it just wasn't doing – the book wasn't doing what I wanted it to do. And I started thinking a lot about what the primary challenges are to, to doing the things that we want. And, and it all comes back to that uncertainty and fear of the unknown and risk and the ambiguity sometimes. And, you know, you, you start doing something and, and you're not quite sure immediately if it's working or not. And so I started uh, – I, I actually dr I dropped the productivity book and decided to really focus on – these themes, which, which as far as I can tell are, are absolutely universal. Every single person struggles with these challenges on, on a daily basis. And the interesting thing about it is they are features of the world. Uh, there is, there is no crystal ball. There is nothing that you can do in advance to figure out if something is, is going to work or not. You just have to, to jump in and start doing it and then take in information from the world, uh, to figure out if you're on the right track or not. And so, uh, a couple of things, uh, happened around the same time. The first is, um, really starting to, to use metaphors to explain this, this mindset that works really well to approach challenges like these. Um, as more of an adventure. So it's it's not a project where the success or failure is binary. It's not the type of thing that you can anticipate everything about what it's going to be in advance. Um, it's something that you're signing up to do because it, it sounds interesting and rewarding to you. And part of what makes it interesting and valuable is the adventure part, you know, going out and exploring something new and seeing if you can make it work. Uh, the other thing is uh, I found out very quickly when you start writing a book about uncertainty and fear of the unknown uh, and you approach it in a uh, research based nonfiction uh, standpoint, uh, you start writing a book that nobody wants to read because it's those those topics are very uncomfortable. And so uh, I started writing the book uh, as an experiment. I didn't know if it was going to work or not, but I started writing a little story. So instead of explaining, here's what history and here's what philosophy and here's what modern cognitive science say about how to deal with these tricky situations, um, the story made it much more like, let's watch someone who has chosen to do something that they know is going to be difficult and they know is probably beyond their current capability. Let's put them into a difficult decision of their own design. And then watch them as they skillfully uh, handle all of the challenges and setbacks and frustrations inherent in doing that task. And so uh, I went through a number of, of different full drafts. And, and after the, the final one, uh, it ended up – How to Fight a Hydra ended up being this, this really neat short story uh, that shows you how to – decide to do something or to pursue something difficult and then uh, handle all of the challenges and setbacks along the way. So I'm, I'm really happy with how it turned out. Yeah. And uh, as I said, it, it, it's a very, it's a quick little read and uh, certainly one you, you, you can finish over a, a cup of coffee. I, I really like the analogy bit because it, it made me feel like I was, it, it struck me in many different ways and I think there's one little sentence. Well, I think it'd be a good idea if we if we just picked on a couple of sentences which I've pulled from the book. If that's okay with you, yeah, sure. We can sort of explain each one as we go along. But um, so what? One of the sentences was, "I must go and f I must go to the Hydra. It will not come to me." Uh, what are your thoughts on on goal setting? Most of the time, 
I do not know what I want to do, but there's always a huge list of the things that I'm afraid of to do. And I don't know if that's a good way of going about what you want to achieve. Um, I think I read somewhere that it was, you know, where are you, where are you in your life right now? By defining your fears may be more rewarding than actually freeing yourself and be more important than defining your goals. I'm just wondering what you have found best in terms of goal setting. And also, yeah, and also so, explain what, what a hydra was to people perhaps who don't know what a hydra is. Oh, sure. So uh, so a hydra, as a, we'll, we'll handle that one uh, first because it'll, it'll make everything else easier. So a hydra is a mythological creature. Uh, it actually goes all the way back to uh, the trials of Hercules uh, in Greek mythology. And a hydra is is this big lizard serpent beast that has multiple heads that all try to eat you at the same time. It's love as a lovely creature. And uh, the important thing about a Hydra is that, um, as, as Hercules found, if you cut off a head, uh, which seems to be a reasonable way of attacking this thing, if you cut off a head but don't do anything after that, uh, not only will it regrow the head, it will actually grow back to more instead. And so uh, to fight a Hydra, you both have to uh, isolate and attack a single head and do it decisively, but you also have to uh, take a moment and consolidate your progress. And in the myth, uh, Hercules uses a torch and uh, to cauterize the stump so the heads can't regrow. And it's it's the, a really great metaphor for both a, a project that has an inherent level of complexity. Uh, there is no straightforward way to to fight a hydra you just have to to wade in and and do your best to isolate it one head at a time but you also can't uh you have to do it in a deliberate strategic way to make progress consolidate that progress uh isolate another head and and do the same thing and keep going until uh until the task is is completed and so i think uh on the uh th there's a, a moment in the book where where the adventurers reflecting uh, to themselves that uh, they're going to have to set off and and find this uh, this creature if this is the the goal that they they want to accomplish it's the the hydra is just not going to randomly wander into town uh, and come up to the adventurer and say hey you know I'm I'm available for you now uh, let's go um, so uh, the I think a lot of people, hope too much that the opportunities that they are 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 desiring are going to suddenly appear uh, ready for the taking. And so I think that whole uh, idea of this thing that you want to do is an adventure. And most times, uh, adventures aren't straightforward propositions. There you ha have a substantial amount of exploration to do. You're going to have to wander around lost in the woods for a while before you find the opportunities that are worth pursuing. And I think knowing that in advance makes it much easier to to set out on the journey in the first place. I know a lot of people who, when they get started, they um, and they're they're wandering around lost for a while, not knowing what to do. They somehow feel that that's an indication that they they shouldn't be doing this or that this is a unique problem for them, right? Everybody else knows what they, they want and everybody else knows what they're supposed to do and 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 they don't. Um, I think it is it's it, it is wonderful to realize that every single person in the world has the same difficulties when it comes to this stuff. And the exploration and the wandering are completely normal and to be expected and don't have – don't bear any relation to who you are or what you're capable of doing. Yes. Um, I, I, I think that sort of ties on nicely to this this, this next sentence which I, I picked up on which was um, – Persist long enough in your efforts to secure lasting victory. The struggle will always take longer and feel more difficult than you expect. Knowing it is going to be difficult makes it easier to keep going. Um, the how, how do you know which sort of the opportunities to focus on pursuing and which ones to avoid or decline? Yeah, 
I, I think there's, there's a couple of different elements. The, the one is like, it kind of goes back to our earlier conversation of is, is this something that you want for you? Is this something that other people are trying to push you into or, or is not something that, that you find rewarding? Um, one of the things that happens early, early on in the story. So no spoilers yeah. is I've no, this is so funny. Like I'm used to writing nonfiction and so, you know, spoilers aren't an issue. And, and this is my first uh, fiction book. So I have to be very careful about what I say. But, uh, but early on in the book, uh, the adventurer, uh, let, let's just say that the people around uh, the adventurer aren't necessarily supportive of this, this new direction. They have desires uh, for the protagonist. And, and a lot of times it, it's particularly early on in our life and career, it, it's, it's very challenging to navigate what others want for us and what we want for ourselves or what sounds like an, an interesting, uh, adventure or journey for, for us to go on. And there's no cut and dried answer to that because sometimes the, the, things that others want for us, they want for us for very good reasons. And, and so it's, it's an exercise in discernment and judgment. Uh, but ultimately, uh, when it comes down to it, if there's something that you really want to pursue, uh, that is information that you should absolutely take into account and, and to the fullest extent of your capabilities, go try, go explore that thing. And, um, it's, it's an interesting challenge because as we go on the adventure, the things that we want for ourselves or the things that we, we find rewarding or useful may very well change. And that's OK. That's called learning. <laughs> so um, it, it's this, this very interesting dynamic of paying attention to the world, paying close attention to what you want and as far as you can tell why you want it. And then collecting information from the world about, is this actually meeting the needs? Is, is this something that you're finding rewarding in the way that you want to find it rewarding? And if it's not, figuring out what you should do next. How much time do you normally give uh, for, for a given sort of pursuit of interest before you abandon it and move on to the next one? So I always do, if it's something completely new, um, I w that's what the, the 20 hour pre-commitment uh, okay. is for. It's essentially, you know, the minimum amount that I, that I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to invest this amount of time. And if I'm horrible and I hate it, then I, I, I will be horrible and I will hate it for at least 20 hours. And then after that point, if it's just totally not worth it, then that's, that's fine. Um, so, and, and that's usually a, a enough time to really figure out if something is for you or not. And I, I think, you know, in the same way that the people don't necessarily, um, are, are not necessarily ambitious enough in what they choose to, to try in the first place. I think a lot of people are, are, um, it's the best way to put it. They don't choose to give up things that are very much worth giving up if that makes sense. Mm. Um, in, in the same way that, uh, a lot of people feel bad if they start to read a book and they're, they're not enjoying the book or not finding the book useful, uh, stop reading the book. It's not, life is short. It's not worth it. Um, so you know, being, being very strategic in the, the pre-commitment helps you push through the rough patch, which, which you can anticipate w with certainty will come. But then if you if you have persisted and persisted and you're you're investing a good chunk of time and it's not what you want it to be, then stop doing it and start doing something else. I really I think that kind of ties really nicely because um, I really like that idea of 20 hours now of of giving something or a new interest 20 hours where it could be yoga uh, to help with golf or uh, it could be writing a book or something, whatever it is, but just giving something 20 hours because if if you give it that amount of time with that sort of 20 or 45 minutes a day for a month like attitude, you know, if if it is going to work or something that's worth pursuing. Um, I think that's 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 really important. And just having almost like that sort of a, a given set amount of time 
Um, yeah. I, I used to work for a firm in, in San Francisco called Monkey Inferno, and we used to build out these very lean startups using sort of Eric Reese's rule, the lean startup. And it was sure. um, building just very small MVPs, uh, minimal viable products to test ideas, you know, and then we would kill them six weeks longer. So the the idea would never last two, three years of, of everyone's invested time. They, we would move and iter- iterate very, very quickly. And if something's not working, it's okay to drop it and move on to the next thing. Right. And that early learning and experimentation is where you get accurate data from the world about what's working and, and what doesn't. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, I think applying that approach to what we decide to pursue for ourselves is is absolutely the way to think about it. You're, you're doing a series of relatively short experiments um, that will require, you know, a certain amount of investment and dedication from you, but aren't necessarily a forever investment. And you, you go out uh, do the experiment, gather the data, and then make a call in um, in what you choose to to continue and what you choose not to. Uh, there's there's actually a really interesting uh, long extended essay on on my website, uh, joshcoffin.net, which is is called Explore Exploit. Okay. And um, this is actually a um, a very long standing problem. Um, it actually comes out of computer science. Uh, but, but it applies to all sorts of different things. Um, what, and, and it tries to answer the question of how much time should you spend exploring the world, doing various experiments to get data? And then how much, uh, of your time and energy should you use to, uh, uh, to direct toward exploiting the best available opportunity? So doing the thing that, you know, works or gets you the reward. And so the, the general, uh, uh, definitely recommend reading the extended essay to get all of the context. But the upshot is that early on in your life or early on in your career, you should spend a lot of time, uh, exploring, experimenting, trying different things, seeing what works, gathering data. And then as you have more experience in a field, you shift the percentage of your time and energy, uh, more and more towards exploring what, you know, works. But the critical bit is the exploration phase never goes away. You're always doing at least a little bit of exploration, figuring out, testing new approaches, gathering data, because those that exploration time is what allows you to take advantage of either shifting conditions, you know, things are changing as you're doing them, or new opportunities that you just haven't tried yet. Hmm. The... The 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 idea of um the, this this next sentence which you wrote in the book of 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 sort of going after things that are are, are very hard and almost training ugly um, you wrote look for a deep dark cave where few people go you're looking for a deep dark ominous cavern something that scares you hydras are revolting they're ugly they stink they try to eat you if you're looking for pleasant company I can't think of a worse companion. When practicing or working on something that matters most to you, what percentage of your time should be sort of in this training ugly like state? Because I think from sort of things I've done in the past, it's when we train in these moments of things that we fear the most or put off the most, we, we likely get the most out of that training. Yeah. So if you think and, and we can uh, we can take this to golf, uh, what are the parts of your game that you just dread? Uh, the things that you hate, the things that you don't look forward to. Um, that emotional aversion, if you've been playing for a, a, a period of time, so not necessarily a new golfer because a lot <laughs> you're probably having challenges with every part of the game uh, when you're brand new. But if you've been playing for a while, what are the parts that you avoid? Or you know, when you go out to, to practice specific skills, um, what are the things that you gravitate to because you really enjoy it? And what are the things that you shy away from because it's, uh, you, you just don't want to have anything to do with it. If you're looking at improvement or, or, uh, trying to spend, to invest your each unit of time and attention in a way that's going to give you the maximum return for it, it probably looks a lot like taking all of the parts of the game that you don't look forward to 
and spending a good chunk of time, you know, 20 hours, give or take, really focusing on improving in that particular area. And what I've, what I found is, um, when you do this, the scary parts of that skill or the parts of, um, what you're practicing that, that you're not looking forward to, those shift in a meaningful way and oftentimes disappear. Um, it's, it's, uh, people generally hate feeling like they're bad at things or that they can't do something that they want to be able to do. It's not a comfortable sensation for anybody. And so being able to notice when you're having that emotional reaction to either an opportunity something or something you want to explore or a part of the work, uh, that just isn't appealing um, and that's a really good indication that there's something beneficial for you to explore there. I wonder if we could touch on the five steps to overcoming uh, a resistance. Uh, I know you touched on this in the, in the book. Uh, in, in what way? Um, oh, there was, there was a couple of uh, steps uh, towards the end of the book where uh, we were referencing in 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 the sort of overcoming resistance. Um, I think they were turning ambitious projects that you require and handling the demands and consistently changing in unpredictable ways. Uh, okay, I gotcha. Yeah. I gotcha. So yeah, I, so if people aren't familiar with resistance as as a term, uh, the term is very <laughs> evocative. Uh, of its own, but but the history of it, it comes from a book called The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield, which I, I highly recommend. Uh, the, the audience there is primarily uh, writers, creative people of all sorts. And, and the book really tries to understand this hesitation or avoidance that we often have when we're trying to do something difficult. And uh, in, in the way that I... Um, I use a hydra as a metaphor for complex, uh, ambitious projects. Uh, Stephen Pressfield uh, essentially personifies resistance as this active force that that you are going to battle with when you sit down and, and do your work. And so, understanding and being able to notice when you're experiencing resistance uh, is important. But there there are some things to understand about the world uh, that even just uh, having your head screwed on straight, uh, if, if that makes sense, uh, it, it is really helpful when you're trying to pursue or make progress on these things that are inherently difficult. And, and I, I, I have a, a list of these things toward, towards the, the back of Hydra, um, that are, are really helpful. So understanding that, that ambitious projects require you to handle competing demands and, and those demands will change. And uh, they're not going to change in ways that you're going to be able to anticipate uh, from the start. Just understanding that this is what this project likely looks like goes a long way in in when those changes happen. Uh, saying, okay, this this is just part of what it is. It's not something wrong with me. It's something about how the world works, and that's fine. Um, in the in the same way. Um, it would be really nice to, uh, so for example, if your goal is to become a scratch golfer, it would be really nice if there was a way to just like pick up a bunch of golf clubs, go to the course over a weekend and, and accomplish that goal all in one shot. Uh, that's not how this stuff works. Like immediate victory is not a possible outcome. This is something that you're going to have to work on for a very long period of time. It's going to require a lot of investment. And some of that investment is not going to be fun. Knowing that in advance makes it much, much easier to both choose to start in the first place and continue to invest long enough to, to get to the result. Um, in the same way, you know it's going to be hard. You know it's going to require a lot of work. Um, those aren't necessarily problems to be solved. They are features of the pursuit. And those features are always going to be there. And in the same way, like you don't know whether or not you're going to be able to do it in advance. That's where that's the uncertainty and the ambiguity. Uh, that's where that comes in. Um, you're going to have to 
be okay with investing your time and energy without knowing if you're going to get the ultimate result. And then the best strategy for, for going about doing this difficult thing is to just choose one thing that needs improvement, focus on that for a while, uh, invest your time and energy in improving that thing. And then when you see that improvement, shift your focus and attention to the thing that needs improved next. This is a, a personal message to all the listeners out there based on that last thing you said is, is not to, I think, I think us golfers are very good at sort of trying to tackle all elements of the game and rather than homing in on that one thing with the given time we do have, we, we try and conquer it all and actually end up with the, the dedicated time we do have is actually, we, we don't actually achieve anything. We just um, generally get worse because we're, we're, we're playing the thing game rather than going deep with certain assets and elements of, of each particular part of the game. Right. Um, uh, so I want to be respectful of your time. You've given us uh, an awful lot of time so far, so thank you so much. Um, I know you have a your own personal action challenge, um, which something you believe in, which the listeners can also try at home. Um, so if you want to fire away. Ready? Yeah, I, I think we'll come back to talking about the pre-commitment. So the the choosing one thing, you know, whether this is in your golf game, or whether this is outside of golf, maybe something that you would benefit from either personally or professionally. And let's say it's something that you've been putting off for a very long time. Like, you know, you probably should improve in this way to get what you want, um, but but you haven't yet. Uh, my challenge to you is to figure out in positive, immediate, concrete, and specific terms what that skill looks like what it looks like for you to be good at this thing. And then look at your calendar and schedule 20 hours over the next month. Pre-commit to, to making that investment of time and energy. And write a few notes to yourself where you are right now, why you've decided that this is a, a worthy place to invest your time and attention, and then what you want to be able to do after this period and start practicing. And I, I think after that investment, you will see a substantial difference in how well you're, you're able to perform and how you feel about that particular subskill uh, versus when you started. So if you have the time and the capacity, I highly recommend uh, make that pre-commitment and start practicing. That's a, that's a great action challenge, which I think all of the listeners can definitely take advantage of, uh, including myself. Um, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, part of, uh, doing this research, uh, is, is that it's, it's useful to a lot of people, but it, it's also the stuff that, uh, is a good reminder and challenge to myself. I'm, I'm doing this all day, every day too. Hmm. I, it's, it's something which, uh, there, there's so many things on, on the list, which, which I think we want to achieve, and and we will we'll try and go after all of them at the same time. And in fact, we actually don't achieve any of them. But I think that approach, you're probably more likely to su succeed than not to. Um, do you have any questions on on my end, Josh? Um, anything which you want to ask me? In in flip the the reverse. I, I I'm personally quite fascinated by just the way you talk. I. Um, I think you're a fantastic communicator and, and that's a skill which I think which I'm going to challenge myself on and uh, going to do a, an improv class and it, I'm going to sign up for it next week. Improv is fantastic. Uh, I think on the, the speaking side of things too, uh, if it is available in your area, uh, one of the speaking trainings that I found uh, very useful is um, the Dale Carnegie Institute. So the, the gentleman who, who wrote how to win friends and influence people, yes, uh, has right next to me. Yeah, totally. Um, uh, their, their public speaking training, which I think is usually done over 10 to 12 weeks. Uh, if you look at it, it's, it's uh, plus or minus 20 hours of training, okay. um, uh, which is uh, just kind of fascinating, but, uh, the primary training methodology is just giving you a lot of experience doing it and then helping you learn to view speaking and communicating as an exciting experience to look forward to. 
instead of something to be concerned about and dread. Um, it's a very simple training methodology and, and I've seen it, it, it it's, it's, uh, brought a lot of benefits to me and I've seen it work for a lot of people. So that, that might be something to, to look forward to. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to do it. I think the question for you and, and kind of going back to, to some of our earlier conversations is, uh, when it comes to golf, what do you want for you? Hmm. It's 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 interesting you ask that because uh, I I have when I was doing my research research on you, you asked this question to a few people. You know, what are you trying to do? What are you defining uh, as a success in your life? And I found a lot of the people couldn't answer it mm-hmm. uh, in a very specific uh, way. And as soon as you ans- asked me that question, I got a little glimpse of everyone else you asked that question to, and. I probably can't answer it in a specific answer right now with my game. I would, Mm -hmm. it would definitely be a vague answer. Like I want to get down to scratch or plus one in my game so I can apply to the Alps tour and try and qualify for that next December. Um, But I I think that, that there wouldn't be an honest answer. Um, the thing I'm, I'm 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 very passionate about now is is this podcast and it I always keep re re going back to a, a very small journal I have in my bedroom when I when I used to write when I was about twelve or thirteen of all the lessons and notes I gathered uh, amongst the best coaches when I was working um, when I used to play for the county and the country and I used to keep this little journal of of all these little best tips and I'd say with the, what I'm trying to work on with my game is 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 reopening that sort of inner fire and interest which I had when I was very young and sharing that that sort of same fire and spark with people around the world and I don't have any expectations of where it's going to go or any any goals it's just more of like I have a, a raw interest of speaking to the best coaches uh, whether it be in golf or business and sharing those tools with with my sort of target audience of golfers and helping them in, in their lives because the game has taught me so much. So I think that's, in a weird way, that's what I'm going to try and do with my game over the next month. And I don't know if that uh, is the right answer or if, if if I need to define that more clearly. That sounds like a wonderful adventure to me. And that is my Definitely hydra. Something. <laughs> yes. that, that is <laughs> something my hydra. Pushing, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there's no key metrics, which I suppose if I was going to get really defined on it, you know, I could put in some more uh, key metrics around that. But um, uh, so, yeah, one thing that might help there is um, don't rush to the metrics bit because that's that's almost in the early stages um, that can almost be an over constraint. Okay. Try to imagine. Uh, two things in as much detail as you can. So what does your life look like after you have already accomplished it? And then what does your day to day activity look like when you are doing this thing at the level that you're, you, you want it to. Mm. So it's much more of an imagination exercise. Okay. Uh, so, and, and that kind of, there's, there's a bunch of, um, of cognitive psychology around this. One of the ways that our brains plan is essentially, uh, imagining what a desired outcome would be and then filling in all of the gaps between where we are now and, and what that desired end state is. So the clearer the end state, um, in terms of metaphor, um, you can't expect your car GPS to work if you don't plug in a destination address at the end. Mm -hmm. Uh, so in the case of our minds, the, the imagining in detail is how you determine that destination. And the more vividly and clearly you can determine for yourself what that looks like, the easier you'll find it to figure out what the next step is. Interesting. Yeah. I I think, uh, that's something I've always, that in reference to your book of, of what, what is my hydro, it would be the, the, the creating a very clear image of of where the journey's going so yeah. um okay so my personal challenge all the listeners is 
improv classes and defining a very specific picture of of what I'm going to be doing with uh, my game and and the podcast. So there's me opening up to everyone. That's fantastic. I'm really looking forward to hearing how it goes. <laughs> That's very kind, Josh. Um, Josh, where where can where can people find you, uh, your work and and your latest book? Yeah. So the best place to find me is uh, my personal website. It's joshkaufman.net. And from there, you can find links to all of my books, uh, including The Personal MBA, First 20 Hours, and How to Fight a Hydra. Great. Thank you so much for this. And um, we may have to do a round two at some point because I've got a whole page worth of questions, which I haven't even touched <laughs> on. And we're an hour and 20 minutes in. So I think um, uh, if, if things have evolved with... Uh, with people's, um, you know, fighting their own hydras and I'll, I'll get them to, to write in of, of what they've challenged themselves with. So, um, perhaps we can touch back on some of these questions, but, um, thank you so much. Uh, this has been absolutely fantastic. And thank you so much for your time and absolutely all the work. Super fun. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I had a blast. Josh, thank you so much. And, um, yeah, hopefully catch you soon. Definitely. Thanks, Chris. Cheers, Josh. Mm-hmm.